what's good y'all this is coach brody now this video is going to be jam-packed with gems this video is about to be jam-packed with all type of advices and, and techniques that you can use to improve your sex life and listen the money that you spend on taking a woman out on a date this is going to be more beneficial right the money that you spend on trying to impress these bitches this is going to be beneficial right so what i'm gonna say right here is this right here right i'm gonna pass the collection plate around my cash app is dollar sign a m a r i b a l l a lot of this shit that i'm giving right now is shit that should not be free this is some game right here this this is not free game but i'm gonna give it to you for free but if you feel like it's blessing you if you feel like you're getting a word because i'm gonna talk about some spirituality in this video as well but if you feel like you're getting a word go ahead and hit my cash app dollar sign a m a r i b a l l it's coach brody it's time for you to enjoy the show something very important to understand is that when it comes to sex right very important to understand that when it comes to sex any body part that has a high concentration of nerve endings under the proper amount of arousal the proper amount of competency to know how to stimulate or to have the equipment to stimulate those particular spots uh, the understanding of, of how to create interoception, which is the mind-body connection, that any highly concentrated spot in the body of nerve endings can be activated and turned into erogenous zones. This is one thing to understand about sex that is very important to understand, right? You know, I have a video called The Orgasm Conspiracy. Where I talk about how masculine energy stifles submissiveness, how a lot of the modern mindsets and philosophies revolving around sex and relationships set women up to be in situations where it highly puts them in a position of having this gentleman gigolo complex. And what this does is it creates a separation between emotional safety and polarity based safety. Now, these are two different things. These are two different things. Now, a woman is typically going to choose the greatest combination of both. Don't think it's just going to be one. Don't think that being the most masculine or the most dominant is going to secure a woman in your life. That's not true. Right? Because if you're extremely masculine, right? Masculine to the point of, let me define some of these terms first, right? Let me define some of these terms. When I define masculine, I think about it like a rock. <clears throat> when I say masculine, what I mean by masculine is to put how you believe things should be and how you choose to interact over the particular person that you're interacting with. Meaning that if someone isn't willing to interact with you according to your program, according to your structure, according to your principles and your values and the way that you view things, then you will determine that you and an individual are incompatible. This is very important to understand. Now, when you're feminine, you put the individual over the way that you would like to do things, the way that your morals and principles and structures work. So simply, one of the easiest ways to truly understand masculine feminine dynamics is person versus principle, right? And another way to understand it is the dominant ego versus the submissive ego very important to understand now the dominant ego is about how you receive ego validation how you receive validation to your ego for your own competency for your own desirability for your own dominance right and submissive right that submissive ego is about how you value another individual very important to understand so when you place and you prejudge an individual as being pre-qualified to interact with you on a particular level, then you are operating from a submissive stance. Because in order to operate with them in the way that they would choose to interact or from a foundation of being feminine, i.e. malleable to the way that they would typically like to interact, this means that you're going with the flow. This means that you are taking a feminine stance towards the individual. This means you are operating out of the submissive ego. Now, the sexual polarity quadrant is something that includes both masculine feminine dynamics and dom sub dynamics. Now, something to understand is this, right? 
there are really eight roles within the sexual polarity quadrant. I know it's called a quadrant, but there's more than just four, right? And it goes in order of cup spaces. So you have the low cup space, right? The low cup space is gonna be masculine, submissive, and feminine dominant, right? Then you have the masculine, submissive exercise and self-control, right? This is the medium cup space. Then you have the high cup space, which is masculine dominant and feminine submissive. And then you have the overflowing cup spaces, which are the masculine dominant exercises and self-control, uh, the integrated masculine and the integrated feminine. There's eight different roles within the quadrant. And then another caveat to bring from here is that the transcending from the low cup space into the high cup space is something that will oftentimes occur through limerence. So that's oftentimes what limerence will be. When you are going from the low cup space and jumping straight into the high cup space. So what's a good example of that? Good example of that would be uh, Marcus and Boomerang. When he was dealing with Jacqueline, he went from feminine dominant up into feminine submissive, but because he didn't have enough energy in his cup and because in this feminine submissive stance, this uh, wasn't with someone who was masculine dominant, who could create a positive feedback loop that would allow a good cycle of energy to take place. He became emotionally and sexually overstimulated through that limerence, uh, perceiving his desire and value for this person to be higher than it would actually be if he got to know them for real. And this led to him going through an emotional roller coaster. Why is it an emotional roller coaster? Because the feminine submissive has a high enough cup space to be in that submissive position, right? Now, what's another example of limerence? I think another great example of limerence would be uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character in 500 Days of Summer. That's a great example of limerence as well, right? And oftentimes, somebody may experience limerence when they're interacting with an individual from a low cup space and an individual is in a medium cup space, meaning a masculine submissive exercise and self-control. That's the easiest way to experience limerence. That as well as an individual who is operating out of feminine dominance, right? Very easy to experience it through that. But you can also experience it through being feminine submissive with somebody who may be masculine dominant, but who may not be properly setting expectations in a way to where there is a cycle of energy that takes place or if an individual begins to delude themselves and lie to themselves. If you're delulu, right, if you're delusional, then you can experience limerence through being in a low cup space and being attracted enough to a person on both a sexual and a non-sexual level to transcend the masculine submissive or the feminine dominant and then to go into uh, the feminine submissive stance. But you can also transcend the low cup space through pain, right? So this let that hurt go dick, let that hurt go pussy. Let that hurt go dick is typically when an individual is in a masculine submissive state of mind or maybe even a masculine submissive exercise and self-control and this is not working for them. They experience pain and hurt maybe through a prematurely integrated relationship and they experience an injury to their anima. Like that's what happens for a man. You experience an injury to your anima and you lose respect towards women. And when you lose a certain level of respect towards women, it's a two sided thing. So one side of that loss of respect is something that can lead you to being more of an asshole, being more direct. Uh, this can be more like mode four within Alan Roger Curry's philosophy, right? Because he has four different modes. You have mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four, but you also have mode 1.5. You also have mode one hardcore. There are some differences between mode one hardcore and mode four. Uh, typically let that hurt go dick is gonna lead to you being in a place of being sometimes mode one, but mostly mode four or mode one hardcore. But the benefits of it are that if you are very direct, very blunt, very uh, assertive in how you approach a woman on a sexual level, then you will come in contact with more women who are feminine submissive towards you or who have a natural inclination towards being feminine submissive towards you. And what this will allow 
is for you to begin to integrate your sexual shadow so that the things that you would typically perceive as disrespectful or abusive are things that someone may naturally desire to where you can communicate these things and operate on this level naturally without your own social programming being something that stands in the way of you reaching peak levels of operating out of a dominant stance. And when you meet someone and you interact with them and they're receptive to how you like to be dominant, then this allows you the opportunity to start integrating the aspects of your sexual shadow that are repressed. And through operating out of these where someone is receptive to it, you get to learn that these things are not inherently disrespectful. These things are not inherently abusive. This is how I got into BDSM. When you learn that these things aren't inherently abusive or inherently disrespectful, then you begin to shift some of your ideology, shift some of your social programming to be a little bit more inclusive. And you begin to negotiate your sexual shadow and your shadow overall with your morals, principles, and values so that you have a more filled in perspective of women's sexual capacity. Now let that hurt go pussy is typically gonna come from a woman who is in a masculine submissive stance, right? Or sometimes a masculine submissive exercise and self-control, but mostly it's a masculine submissive stance. And from that masculine submissive stance, a woman may find herself in a position where her social programming, her desire doesn't transcend her social programming. So she may hear a lot of things from a man that he wants or desires, but because her social programming is too strong to allow herself to relinquish that level of control, maybe she operates highly out of a dominant sexual ego. Something to understand is that a woman who's in her masculine energy operates primarily out of a dominant sexual ego, right? Very important to understand. And what does that look like? Well, that can look like a woman who says, this guy's taking me out, he's giving me validation, he's making me feel good about myself. And because he's giving me emotional validation, social validation, financial validation, and I'm attracted enough to him, then I want to reciprocate him making me feel non-sexually valuable by giving him access to me sexually. But in doing this, <clears throat> I want him to feel pleased the way that I feel pleased, but in a reciprocal manner. So it's like, okay, cool. Well, you're making me feel good, so I want to make you feel good. But when a woman has that perspective of you make me feel good, so I want to make you feel good. If she doesn't have a high enough level of a selfish desire for her own sexual gratification and pleasure or a high enough capacity to relinquish control or enough feminine energy within her cup when it comes to how she interacts with this particular man, then what will particularly occur, what will typically occur is that if this man is more dominant then how far he would want to push her into her own desire to experience pleasure and to relinquish control is going to be too much. And eventually this is going to drain her cup if she isn't in a feminist submissive space, it's a high enough cup space. But if they're in a long-term relationship, the energy that he's pouring into her is going to be something that she's not going to be able to fully reciprocate on the level that the man would desire her to. And this will eventually lead to a breakdown of the trust and the safety within the man. And this will lead down, lead to a breakdown of the woman feeling safe because she's going to feel pressure rather than freedom. This will also lead to covert contracts. And once the man breaks those covert contracts, the woman has in her own mind about how much emotional validation, meaning comfort that the man provides her, or he breaks their understanding and cheats on her, or he does certain things that break her perception of how good of a person she is and how good of a person he is, then what this does is it allows a woman to get into a space where all the sexual energy that was poured into her that she was unable to reciprocate, it gets bottled up. And once it gets bottled up and uh, resentment, uh, these things lead up to resentment and resentment leads up to uh, entitlement and entitlement leads up to spite and these things occur, then it makes it very easy for her to be able to bypass her typical social program and once she meets an individual who she has a high enough level of sexual attraction towards right especially if this is someone who's willing to pander to her or someone who is willing to be show her a different way of interacting right so there's really two ways that this transcending of the masculine submissive occurs for a woman or for a submissive individual right either the masculine structure the, the principles that you cling to are ones in which you begin to question, right? 
and you're in a space of confliction and contradiction and you just need a break you need an escape so then you meet someone who's willing to offer that escape which is what the gigolo does and through that experience you get to release all of this sexual energy that's been bottled up over a long period of time now one thing i'll say is this as a man if you're primarily masculine or you're primarily dominant which most men are going to be on some level even if they don't display it what can occur is this right if you're primarily masculine if you're primarily dominant if you are uh, attached to and connected to a woman first primarily through your emotions right feminine energy rather than through the principle and the structure of how you want to interact with her right then this leads to premature integration where you will either stifle your own dominance through masculine submissiveness, right? Either stifle your own dominance and repress it, suppress it, or you will let go of certain morals and principles and structures that you have to be more fluid, right? Because feminine energy corrupts dominance to become more fluid towards the woman and, and the way she wants to interact in order to try and circumvent, circumvent her boundaries. To circumvent her psychological reactions, to circumvent uh, her social programming. Rather than walking through the front door, you try to walk in through the back door. You get what I'm saying? And for a woman, right? Because we got to understand that as a man, we're primarily going to be masculine. What does this mean? What this means is that we have these different aspects and things that amalgamate to make up who a person is. I'm a big fan and a big pundit when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to young in psychology, right? Now I heard somebody say before that both a man and a woman have both the animus and the animal, right? You know, the animus is a woman's internal perception of how she views men, how she relates to men from her experiences with men, from the things she sees in social media, but it also relates to her own moral structures and values. And typically because she doesn't operate first out of this animus, first out of this masculine logos principle, it creates a scenario where this is going to be typically very black and white. It's not going to be very holistic about what makes up what a man really is. And it's going to be something where if her social program is extremely strong, she's going to desexualize one aspect of a man, right? Which is creating the gentleman saying that this is the standard of how a man should treat her and interact with her. And then she's going to purely sexualize, but also villainize the other aspect of a man who she views as the gigolo. So it's like a nice guy and a fuck boy. Most people only see things through this binary lens, through this binary lens. But there's more than just a fuck boy and a nice guy, right? Because a nice guy is not truly a feminine submissive man, right? A gentleman is not truly a feminine submissive man, right? See, the thing to understand about people who are in a low cup space is that they're typically going to be delusional about speaking from their social programming with this very idealistic perspective of someone who is from a truly integrated space when really they'd be having to skip a whole two levels a whole one or two levels of where their own energy is in order to attract that person so it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to come across this individual unless you just get lucky right now something to understand is that a woman has her own anima which is how she perceives herself Many times if a woman experiences limerence, she's going to play the anima for a period of time. By playing the anima, whichever perspective of how a man's anima is set up to how he wants to perceive a woman is going to be a role that she plays and perceives herself as for that period of time. It's called playing the anima. So that means that if this is a man who she really likes, but he has a Madonna whore complex and she wants to be taken seriously and that's what he wants, then she will place herself in that desexualize Madonna aspect of what it means to be a woman and if she doesn't have experience transcending that and integrating the sexual and the non-sexual then she will repress her own sexuality both to that man and to the outside world in order to protect this view that she has of herself this is called being the Topanga but the thing about it is that energy cannot be created nor destroyed she's not going to feel fully free until her sexual energy is flowing but then you also have uh, the other side of playing the animal and the other side of playing the anima is to be the whore, right? And when a woman decides to be the whore, if she's playing the whore, playing the harlot, right? With a man who 
doesn't have an integrated enough anima to uh, respect this and to perceive this, and she's playing this role across the board, then that's typically going to be a man who doesn't trust her level of sexual discipline and is not going to be looking to take her seriously in a long-term relationship. And there's going to be some women who will just try to be as sexual as possible in order to get a man to eventually like them. But understand that sex is not connected to a man's submissive ego. People have emotional uh, uh, connections and attachments based off of their own investment and based off of their own submissive ego. It's not based off of their dominant ego. Understand that. So, you know, sometimes men will get mad at women because it's like, it doesn't make sense if I'm willing to do this for you and this for you and this for you and this for you. And I'm willing to be all this invested in you and I love you. Why can't you choose me? Well, the truth is that an individual's investment is based off of their submissive ego. It's not based off of what you do for them. It's based off of what they're willing to do for you. No, no, no. Yeah, 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 that's what I mean. Hopefully that didn't get a little bit confusing. So when we're looking at a man, he also has both the animus and the animal. This is a perspective that I like. Not everyone agrees with this perspective. If it's wrong, cool. But this is just my belief when it comes to young in psychology, right? Because a man spends most of his time identifying with the logos, identifying with the masculine principle of who he is, with his logic, whether that's socially programmed logic that is pushed onto him through social programming, through society, through life, through what he believes a man should be, sometimes even from toxic masculinity, then what a man will do is he may have this Madonna whore complex. He doesn't spend most of his time uh, identifying with the anima, so he has to split up the different sides of what a woman is made of in order to simplify life, right? But a man can also play the animus, right? How do you play the animus? By wanting to play the role of the nice guy, wanting to play the role of the gentleman, uh, desexualizing yourself to make a woman comfortable, that's playing the animus, or being a purely sexual being who has no emotional intelligence or who has no capacity for emotional connection or attachment. Now, this isn't true because we all have masculine, feminine, dominant, and submissive within us. The matter of the fact is that Whatever role that we primarily are, whoever we primarily are, is going to be a role that we need to learn how to operate out of our first role primarily and then earn the right to, through experience and through dealing with an individual who resonates with the type of anima or animus that we have, to be able to move forward with that and then to organically build towards having that type of connection with them. And this is where the polarity level comes in, right? When you're operating at a polarity, meaning masculine dominant with feminine submissive, then as a masculine dominant, you're putting your principle first, you're putting the structure first. And in putting the principle and the structure first, you have a very limited amount of emotional investment, social investment, financial investment initially. Through the woman getting on your program, which is submitting herself to your program and submitting herself and, and relinquishing some of her social programming in order to resonate with the structure that you provide to her then this creates a foundation for both desire and respect now understand the gigolo receives desire but he does not receive respect the the nice guy or the gentleman he receives some semblance of respect but this is respect that limits the perspective of how she views him so i'll put it like this is something i love to say all the time a man who is a war veteran who cries when he's receiving a medal of honor because he had comrades who died on the battlefield is not a weak man. That's not weak. You're entering into more of an integrated space. When you see an individual who is crying every time a woman doesn't text him back and having a nervous breakdown, every time a woman, the woman doesn't text him back, he's anima possessed. He's not operating out of the anima from a place of having a solid foundation in masculinity and having solid experiences with proving his dominance to himself. He is simply someone who is possessed by his anima through his inability to be dominant very important concept to understand right so there's reasons i bring these things up now keep in mind there's also the integrated space right there's the integrated feminine understand that in a woman's dominant ego it's that feeling of safety right there, there's a feeling of safety that comes from um having her emotions validated having her feelings and what she wants out of life to be something that a man resonates with a man not judging her for her actions and behaviors but understand that security and safety is not 
both some unlimited thing because both people need it on some level right both people need it on some level so when a woman is playing the role of the madonna or the whore it's very difficult for a man to create a certain level of trust and safety with the woman based off of their everyday interactions right so when you're dealing with a woman who is playing the role of the whore for you then you may separate your ego from anything she does outside of you in order to avoid being overly emotionally or ego invested in her behaviors and then you just take the safety from feeling desired and stroked within your dominant ego as you interact with her on a regular basis so that means how submissive she is in your presence that's what matters anything outside of that does not matter but understand that if you're in a long-term relationship especially with children involved you need to de deal with the woman who is either naturally or very heavily inclined towards being monogamous towards you and you're competent enough to sustain the cycle of energy and her needs being met or you need to be on an integrated level where you pretty much reach a place of compersion stag cuckold whatever it is and you really are unbothered by the things that she does without having to remove yourself or limit how emotionally financially and socially invested you can be in her in order to sustain that cycle of energy right very important to understand most masculine dominant men this is a high cup space this isn't even even a, a overflowing cup space and this isn't even a, a low cup space most masculine dominant men are not going to choose to be emotionally invested in women who are promiscuous maybe promiscuous before he met her because he's suspending judgment but maybe not promiscuous after the point where he begins to invest in her emotionally because understand this only a cuckold or a cut queen is going to be cool with and okay with an individual who they're invested in with their submissive ego being more submissive to another person now what can this mean a man who is more emotionally invested in another woman just because she's new just because she's novel uh being more financially invested in a woman just because she's new just because she's novel most women even who would use past theory and be okay with the fact that he's promiscuous would not be okay with him being ready to jump directly into a relationship with a new woman when she's put much much more work in right because a man's attraction to a woman is going to be more so correlated to his submissive ego than just his dominant ego very important to understand so most masculine dominant men aren't going to place the premium of what he values a woman by as uh just how beautiful and physically appealing she is how sexually attractive she is that's not going to be the the number one priority when it comes to emotional investment for a man because that's not connected to his submissive ego when it comes to just sex because what it means being dominant is that you're the primary giver of pleasure and the primary receiver of control right the more attractive a woman is the more you perceive her capacity to provide you pleasure or the higher of a standard you view her as to where you give yourself down the ego validation for your capacity to have access to her sexually to take her to certain places sexually right very important to grasp very important to understand so when we're having this whole conversation about interoception it's a lot of different things that go into it a lot of things that go into it but let's say you want to start off with the simplest things first the easiest things first sometimes the easiest thing to start off with is just a clitoral orgasm the more experience a person has the more they've already created that mind body connection and what do i mean by that when i say interoception it's having the capacity to be able to use stimulation to bring yourself to the point of orgasm uh knowing how to utilize your own pc muscles key goals such and such in order to uh, create those contractions that eventually lead up into uh, involuntary contractions and repetitive involuntary contractions that bring a intense feeling of pleasure and a loss of control is really what orgasms are all about and what they're made of right so the more aroused you are the easier it is for a connection to be made between stimulation and contractions and the easier it is for that connection to be made between contractions and orgasms the easier right so let's say you start with the clit now the clit's the easiest from that point you might go into just having conversations with a woman where you're talking to her about different types of orgasmic experiences that she's had then you can branch out into more of the vaginal orgasm type of territory where it may be with there's a certain type of trust that comes dom sub trust right that trust is do i believe that you can take me there 
if a woman has sex with you a whole bunch of times and she never has an orgasm, then it's going to take more time for her to reach a place where that trust can be developed. This is why the biology first approach is so powerful. You know, the quicker I started having sex with a woman before I met her, the easier it would be for me to give her orgasms. The longer it would take, typically the longer it would take, right? Uh, that, that's the truth of the matter. There's been some women that I dealt with and they would have orgasm penetration the first time. There'd be some women where it would take a couple times or a few times, some it'd take a couple weeks. There was one that took like eight months and there was another one that took like years, right? So it's very important to understand that the trust that comes with those dom sub dynamics sexually is something that is easily established a lot quicker, but the more time that you put into it, the more important it is for an individual uh, with their safety to be able to be honest with you, but in order for them to be honest with you, without you no longer feeling safe with them, they don't need to be giving another individual the opportunity to give them that same experience, or this will take your perception of them just not having that capacity yet or not having that experience yet and then you'll begin to interpret them if they don't really like you they're not really that attracted to you they aren't really feeling you like that and this is what let that hurt go dick and let that hurt go pussy does right now this especially this is what let that hurt go pussy does like this is oftentimes the price of premature integration when it comes to premature integration if you're unable to create that cycle of energy or to create those dom sub dynamics on a sexual level to where there's a relinquishing of control, then oftentimes it will be repressed. And then the next man and woman comes across is going to be who she's able to have that experience with. And this is going to be a powerful concept I'm about to bring up to y'all, right? Trauma bonds and Stockholm syndrome. Now, Stockholm syndrome is not something that is inherently 100% bad, right? Because let's say your social programming, your animus as a woman being triggered due to the directness and the bluntness of the man that you're with and his honesty being something that goes against your social programming is what has led to pain within your relationship, not actually him being an abusive individual. Now, if this frustration builds up over time and you're able to have makeup sex or let's say you go through a breakup and you begin to miss him due to the lack of access and then when you finally get to see him you have sex again and then his let that hurt go dick has raised him beyond a certain level of having a certain level of respect for you so he's willing to be more dominant he's willing to be more aggressive he's willing to be more intense and then a, a woman's perspective is because she feels she hasn't had access to that man in a while or because she questions her own standards and beliefs because she's seen within herself that capacity through her fantasies and she didn't shy away from these things then she may be opened up to new sexual experiences new sexual activities without actually having to engage with these activities with other people and sometimes she does and it just doesn't work out but what happens is through that stockholm syndrome this is where the trauma bond the connection be able to strengthen don't think that the only correct way to engage with and to connect with your partner is through positive energy because you also have negative energy right you also have the, the the shadow and a certain level of safety comes about in relationships through the ability to have intimacy with your shadow and the shadow of the par partner that you're with and this is why utilizing kinks and fetishes and interoception and, and classical condition and these different things is so powerful for the strengthening of the intimacy within a relationship because sometimes two people get along well on a non-sexual level but because of their social programming or the way they met this is where premature integration comes from it's very difficult for them to establish the sexual dynamic as well as they'd like to and oftentimes you have a false sense of compatibility when you meet a new person because all of the things that were poured into you all the things you heard that created this feeling of pressure and psychological reactance about things that you weren't willing to do because of resentment, because of whatever was going on, because of being unsure. When a woman meets a man who she doesn't associate with her social pro programming on a certain level, she has the capacity to experience these things. But it's two things you need to understand, right? It's two things that allow sexual energy transmutation primarily, right? There is having a certain level of safety, emotional safety, and then also having a baseline of sexual attraction being hit, right? Now that baseline of sexual attraction can be boosted through the kinks and fetishes and also through the emotional roller coaster of a situation. But then you also have the safety and the safety is being able to express yourself and feel heard and accepted within your truth, right? But there's different types of safety, right? There's being, you can create safety through presenting yourself as harmless and you can create safety through presenting yourself as bigger than what that person is afraid of. 
So that means that if a person's social programming is meant for this purpose, the purpose that you're presenting their, their social programming is rose, risen up from, which is the animus within a woman, if the purpose of that animus is very short-sighted, if the positive, if most of the positives that come with that social programming are present, right? But you also get the added benefit of going to this highly submissive state of mind, whether that's going through subspace, multiple orgasms, squirting, all these different things, then you start to reach a more integrated space. Now, it's easier to go straight for the submissive aspect and then to build up to the dominant aspect because then it's a matter of rewarding good behavior. But if it's not like that, then it's going to be difficult to create that same level of safety when you're not already receiving a certain level of safety yourself as a man. It's more difficult. So oftentimes the price of premature integration is let that hurt go pussy. Oftentimes the price of it is that a woman will experience these higher levels of sexual desire, attraction, and submissiveness with another man rather than the man who's already invested in her and part of the reason why i make these youtube videos is so that y'all can avoid these things right because that's how your chest end up hurt right that's what it is so understand these things understand them so let's let's divvy out into some more different variations of orgasms that can occur there's so many i'm not going to cover all of them right now but like i said it's easier to start with the clitoral but i'll say that when it comes to the clitoral and the whole thing about uh this being something that a woman can do without a partner, something a woman can do without being extremely aroused. It's something where stimulation alone has created a strong enough level of trust and the consistency of that clitoral orgasm that without even being highly aroused, she can still have it, which means that you can a woman can have like a six level of sexual attraction to you, a seven level of sexual attraction to you, maybe even a five level of sexual attraction to you and still have a clitoral orgasm. It's the same as how a clit is homologous to a penis where a penis can have an orgasm with a woman you're not even attracted to because you understand interoception, the mind-body connection for your own penis. The clit and the penis are made out of the same materials. And this would, would fuck some dudes' heads up. The, the G-spot and the prostate homologous, made out of the same materials. The skein's gland and the prostate, right? I ain't messing with mine. That's not what I'm on. But I don't think it's gay if you mess with yours or if you allow a woman to. I don't think anything a man does with a woman is gay. Right. I'll make that clear right now. So I'm not one of those people who's going to take this virtue signaling, you know, uh, perspective of judging another man's masculinity like that. That's not my point of view. But what I will say is this, that it takes more of a loss of control for a woman to experience vaginal orgasm from penetration than it does for her to experience clitoral orgasms, because most women are going to masturbate throughout their lives, primarily through clitoral stimulation. And then there's going to be some women who are wired, right? I heard, I learned that word from somebody recently, but it's basically just uh, a lot of women have, they say it's 2% of women, but I think it's more than that because I've dealt with plenty of women who had it, but to have orgasm from nipple stimulation. There's some men who can too, but I think it's a lot less than the women who can or women who have. And I'll say this, can and have a capacity to are two completely separate things because a woman could have a capacity for orgasm and penetration and not have them for years and just think her body doesn't work like that. And if you allow a woman to talk to you as if her body just doesn't work like that and then you accept that, you set yourself up for not actually putting in the work to create that experience, to share that experience, and then it will make you feel very unsafe if she has that experience with someone else. And this is the thing about it. It's like don't jump above your security level when it comes to dealing with a woman right like let's say you're in a situation where it's all about open honesty and communication and you're on some poly shit or you're on some swinger shit if, if you've never given that woman a vaginal orgasm for penetration made her come from quick sex uh like a quickie you never have me give her a vaginal orgasm from a quickie uh never hit certain spots you never were able to give her an orgasm from slow sex to make love with her you've never been able to give her multiple orgasms like back to back and you get to choose the amount if you've never been able to make a woman squirt if you've never been able to if that woman's never been able to have an, an orgasm from giving you head or a throat gasm uh understand that the novelty and the excitement of a new exciting fantasy type of experience can push a woman on over the edge to have an experience that she didn't think she could and you will have to deal with the internal fight of whether or not this other man, like let's say you're swingers and you're doing like a male, male, female threesome. I done heard plenty of horror stories. You're not gonna know whether or not in her mind and in her body that dick is just way better than yours, especially if it's bigger, right? You're not gonna know whether or not that's what's going on or whether or not it's just the excitement and the, the safety 
of feeling that you're someone she can share this fantasy experience with. So I say make sure you set a baseline of what experiences you need to share with a woman before you're both open to being emotionally invested, socially invested, financially invested, and being in a relationship that is not monogamous on the woman's side, right? <laughs> like, I can just keep it a buck with you. I'm gonna just keep it a buck with you on that. Don't set yourself up for failure because if you set yourself up for failure and the safety is lost, sometimes, most of the time, it's not just the fact that another dude has quote unquote better dick. Sometimes it's simply a matter of how you're treating the woman and how you feel about the woman after a situation that you allow and permit is something that will cause her to feel as if you're judging her and it'll kill the safety and she will have a false sense of safety with this other man because guess what nine out of ten that other man is not going to be cool with being emotionally socially financially invested and going through a reciprocal type of situation where another man comes through with a bigger dick makes her nut all over the place right in front of him in a way he didn't expect while he's the one who's going to bed with her night saying that's who he loves right so part of that trust is not just the woman's trust that you can give her that experience but your trust that you can give her that experience and that she's open to relinquishing power and control on that level very important concept to understand watch my videos on the primer principle because this is i got videos on the primer principle where these things can happen right like let's say you have a submissive you're using this interoception you're using this classical conditioning you're opening up her up to new types of orgasmic experiences if she is not sexually exclusive with you during this period of time then you may use this interoception paint this picture for her have conversations about it and then from that place she may go sleep with somebody else who got some different equipment who's a little bit easier it's a little bit easier for them to stimulate that particular spot and then from that point she may have that orgasm with them first and then when she communicates with you and it's not in the same way especially if she doesn't know how to separate sex from emotions or if the way she speaks to you is from this highly desire filled space and she starts talking to you different and like i remember one time i was dealing with this girl and we were having a conversation about sex and i'm like i got some good dick she's like no you got great dick great dick Man, she went fuck with this donkey dick nigga with the, the, the macaroni elbow on that bitch. Man, she was squirt. Uh, no, no, she didn't squirt, but she had her first G-spot orgasm. That wasn't on my itinerary until the next week. So there was a few days between us seeing each other. She went and slept with someone else, had that experience. She started talking to me different. I was hurt about the situation because of my own you know, fears of inadequacy. Listen, we are all people. We all have insecurities. So don't think nothing wrong with that. I'm blessed. So I'm like, damn, bitch, if my dick big and this nigga dick way bigger than mine, where the fuck you finding these donkey dick niggas at? Right. But anywho, that's not the point. So, man, a couple days later or like a week later, I taxed her a little bit, went through this process of rebuilding that primer principle, uh, got her investment high on a sexual level, on a financial level, on an emotional level, got that really high. So the next time I seen her, yeah, that previous guy she may have had sex with him for maybe four or five hours and i've done that with her before but she has sex with maybe four or five hours and he probably made her come about i think she said about four or five times right and but he was one of them dudes who could just nut and keep going that's not me right i mean i've taught myself how to do it but i can't do it consistently there's certain things you got to learn when it comes to that right your arousal has to be really high and you have to know how to orbit and orbiting is a powerful concept it's indirect stimulation while maintaining arousal so that you get right back on that right back on that cycle of going back towards orgasm shortly after having an orgasm so as a man you can have multiple orgasms as well it's not just something for women but understand that vaginally versus clitoral is two different things so you can deal with a woman who has multiple orgasms from vaginal stim stimulation but does not and currently doesn't have multiple orgasms from clitoral stimulation because the clit has a refractory time and the same way that the penis has a refractory time the clit has a refractory time understand that right so it's a little bit easier when it comes to internal orgasms right uh so through these experiences i think the next time i saw her she had like maybe four or five within that what five four or five six hour period of time she was having sex with the guy but what she liked a lot about it was that the dude gave her the validation of making her feel desired, making her feel more wanted, making her feel more sexually powerful. And this was a great experience for her because he was like begging to get back in the pussy and begging like shit like that during sex. And that's something that really turned her on. And I've used that before, but that's something where I don't play with it too much. I'm primarily a dominant. I'm not a hard switch. I'm a soft switch. You know, my switch side has to be earned. I don't just give that to everybody. Right. 
So, but the next time I seen her, we probably had sex for like an hour. And I made her nut like eight times in an hour. You know, I took back that spot of the strongest orgasm she ever had. I found a way to give her that, uh, that G-spot orgasm that I hadn't given her yet. So I found a way to do it. And I think the way I did it was, you know, I was on a, had her on a chair. I dug my fingers behind her pubis mons, like her pubic area, pushed down on her G-spot. I was on my knees off the side of the chair while she was on her back on the chair so that I could angle my dick up so that the head of my dick was hitting right on her G-spot. I gave her that. Then, you know, I was choking her, pulling her hair, throwing her around and gave her like eight orgasms in like an hour period of time. I took back that spot because part of that safety for a band to a certain extent is feeling that you are either at the peak of her experiences or that you trust that you have a capacity to be so that you do not feel as if you are being cuckolded by being emotionally invested in a woman or by being invested with your time. You don't want to feel like the validation that you're giving a woman is being poured into another man on a sexual level because dominant ego validation comes in, submissive ego validation comes out, right? Dominant energy comes in, submissive energy goes out. And these places of energy take place on a social, the sexual, and the self-preservation level. Keep in mind, all three of these things can include sex and all of these things cannot include sex. So it, when I say sexual level, I'm just talking about the instinctual variance of the Enneagram. I'm not talking about just a sexual relationship. Understand what I'm saying. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Watch my video on, you know, blur pill rant, monkey kill shot and gun, you know, using the intensity of eye contact, right? So there's this one woman I dealt with where it's a lot of different experiences you can paint in a woman's mind. Um, I think one of the best ways to really establish this interoception when it comes to this is just to give a woman an experience where something that she typically views as something she gives a man is something she views as if she's receiving. So when you know how to operate on a woman's validational centers, her reward systems, the dopamine systems, when it comes to how she gives you head, where when she gives you head, you're giving her instructions. And when she follows those instructions, you reward her with validation, whether that's busting a nut, whether that's the dick jumping, whether that's your balls jumping, whether that's moaning, whether that's grunting, whether that's your eyes rolling in the back of your head, this is going to give her like this boost of dopamine, this boost of validation that makes her feel good. If her respect and desire for you isn't high enough, it's not going to have a high enough value of validation for this to encourage her to want to keep doing this consistently or really at all. So then it just comes off as if you're kind of tender or then it comes off as, OK, now we got that over with. Right. But once a woman gets to the place where her desire gets high enough, then it's like the pacifier principle. Right. Rather than head being something she's doing to pacify you, head becomes something she's doing to pacify herself. And there's very rare instances where a woman's like, let's say a woman's trying to go towards the integrated space. She can get to a space where she doesn't really desire to have sex, but she still wants to give you head to pacify herself because of the validation she receives from giving you head. Now, this is something that you'll probably get through when it comes to being integrated or going from premature integration into trying to work up into polarity or integration. Uh, but that's more of a rare thing. There's that oral fixation thing. But anything that feels uncomfortable when it's touched for the most part is something that can eventually lead towards some type of orgasm right so when a woman is having sex with you and she starts to feel like let's say you're talking to a woman and say like tell her like this dick feels good in your mouth don't it that woman will start to think in her mind and create a, a mind body connection between the arousal and the stimulation so rather than thinking about the control of the stimulation she's giving you to give you pleasure it's going to be thinking about how much pleasure she's receiving and how much validation she feels she's receiving through you allowing her to suck your dick. And then when it's going in and out of her mouth, say, oh, like imagine that that mouth is your pussy, right? And then she starts to imagine the pleasure that she's receiving from giving you head. Once you establish this and a woman feels this, if you ride the momentum of that, you can ride that momentum into giving a woman her first vaginal orgasm penetration, uh, get a woman to cry during sex, because whatever you tell her, when you open up her eyes to a new way of experiencing sex, when you plant that flag, whatever you tell her is something that is going to kind of work the way manifestation works, right? How does manifestation work? How the law of attraction and manifestation works for me is a thought will be presented to me in my mind, right? Either I'll hear it and it'll resonate with me or I'll feel it or something to pop up in my mind. This is kind of how manifestation works and faith works for me when it comes to my relationship with God. An idea will pop up. It feels like it's just coming from a pure place or whatever it is. And when that comes up, I just accept it. And I say, you know what? I like that. 
I just receive it and then I leave it alone and I don't try to put pressure or force towards making it happen. But my actions begin to align themselves with it. This has happened several times in my life. I remember a point in time in my life where I just got to college. I never had a car before. Didn't have enough money to get a car. I wasn't sure when I was going to get a car. The, my father at the time, he, you know, he had got laid off or something like that. So it wasn't a situation where he really had uh, gainful employment at that moment. And I remember thinking to myself, I was riding, I was walking to the bus one day because I was going to college. And when I was walking to the bus one day, I was like, Father God, this is not it. Like, this is not it. I'm like, I, I need a car because it was raining and stuff. And I was just, I was aggravated. And just something in me said, you need a car, Amari. Amari, you need a car. You want a car? And I just said, okay, cool. Maybe a week or two later, I was, I saw a Volvo. And I'm like, I kind of want my first car to be a Volvo for some reason. I just accepted it, received it, moved on. And then sometime after that, I was riding by, I didn't say anything to anyone. I was riding by this car shop, right? This, this car lot. And I saw this red Volvo S70, right? This 1998 red Volvo S70. I said, I would like that car. That car is kind of dope to me. Two weeks later, I never talked to anybody about this. Two weeks later, I came home from school one day and my father found a way without even having his own spot at the time. I got a real ass father because some shit went down. His father died. He went through depression. Like these are things that happen. And I came home after work because I was at my grandmother's house at the time. And I got the 1998 Volvo S70 that I saw at that lot one day, and I just received it in my mind. Now, orgasms can work in a similar way when it comes to manifestation. And I know this is some deep shit that I'm saying right now. Let me give you another example. And this is why integrating the shadow is so important. Uh, not judging yourself, uh, not having this Madonna whore complex or this desexualized spirituality. This is why this is so important. I'm gonna give you an example. I remember, when I was young, one time, I think I was 21 at the time, I was masturbating and I busted a nut and I just saw it go up like maybe the first shot went up like two, three inches and then the rest of it just dripped down. I'm like, man, this shit looks pitiful. And then something in my mind, it felt like God was talking to me. I know it's going to sound weird, but it's like, would you like to be a shooter? I'm like, man, I want to be a shooter. <laughs> I want to be able to shoot my nut. That's what I want to be able to do. And something in me just just received it. I felt a little peace about it. I felt a little excitement about it. And I just received it. Man, a couple months later, or I don't know if it was a year later, a couple months later, I didn't actively try to do it. But just sometime along that process, I just got a lot into edging. And then before you know it, I was able to shoot. My, I literally measured it because this is something that I, it would be my version of a rainbow. That's kind of how wild I am. I looked at this shit as like a, a proof of promise that that guys gives a or without repentance and that yes and amen so for me i busted my nut one day and i just started measuring it and i'm like yo this shit can shoot my record is like six and a half seven feet away from my body so i went from like two to three inches of shooting a nut to about six and a half to seven feet right and no i'm not still at that point it's still pretty far but what this did for me was it showed me that anything is possible <laughs> like on some damn yo Romero type shit, right? And when you start learning these things, right? That's how it works. Same thing with my foot fetish, right? I remember one day I was with a homeboy of mine. We were in a rap duo together. We were practicing. I think we were listening to the internet at the time. I still love the internet. And I still love Steve Lacey, who was like a product of the internet. A lot of my musical inspiration came from listening to Odd Future back in the day. But uh, we were listening to the internet. I think it was Don't You? Don't you want me? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you want me? That was my shit right there, right? But he said something about some girl feet being pretty or something. I didn't put too much thought into it. But I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I'm not going to judge it. Before you know it, I started to, I was on Pornhub one day and I think I saw something about feet pop up. Might have been a Google algorithm thing where it just popped up on my phone. I don't know. But I saw it. I watched it. And I started to imagine. I'm like, this shit seemed like it's pretty cool. Before you know it, I'll just be out and about. And I started to compare and contrast. Say, okay, what feet are pretty to me? What feet are not? And then because I grew up watching so much porn, my brain kind of fried when it comes to just getting hard just because I see a pussy or just because I see an ass or just because I see some titties. I like them. I love them. I'm a heterosexual man. 
but just seeing ass and titties i done fucked plenty of bitches it's just it don't just make me hard just to be hard it's like the woman's energy will make me hard you know what i mean a woman's submissiveness towards me will turn me on a woman showing active desire towards me will turn me on give me hard but as far as just physical characteristics i have to be able to create that connection that interoception between high levels of pleasure or high levels of arousal or something kinky and nasty and a little bit taboo something freaky and pleasure in my mind to create that feeling of getting just aroused just from looking at something most of the time i just like to get some head right shit jump start me give me a head start that's what i like because i don't have sex with women who don't suck dick no way so that's not a problem for me like dealing with like it's not a problem for me dealing with like uh what's that shit called erectile dysfunction i'm a young man i ain't got no problems with that but i do like a head start right and i'll say this if you are a man who's dominant and you're dealing with erectile dysfunction understand performance anxiety but also understand that when you're masculine you experience less pleasure when you're dominant you experience less pleasure in order to have unlimited stamina having sex with a woman oftentimes you either have to be somebody who can nut and keep going or you have to be someone who knows how to lessen how much pleasure you're experiencing or to create a break in the connection and the link between stimulation uh contractions and orgasm and when you create a break in the link between those things, you pretty much have unlimited stamina. Unlimited. You can fuck for hours. And I learned how to do this throughout my life, but it also led to issues. Like, I had times where women would turn me down for sex because they felt like it took me too long to nut. I was dealing with a woman recently. Bad. Oh, man, she fine as fuck. But the matter of the fact was, me and her could be having sex for a long time and I wouldn't have orgasm because in my mind it's something that kind of just clicks where if a woman doesn't have orgasm or penetration in the first 10-15 minutes of sex then my body kind of goes into autopilot and I'm not gonna nut unless she's giving me head exactly the way I want it for a certain amount of time so I'll just fuck a woman and give her head I mean have her give me head to finish me off but part of it also comes from the dom sub dynamics I don't chase women right I don't do that pursuing shit I don't do that trying to get at a woman just to get some pussy thing and because of that, it doesn't work like that. In the rare moments where I allow that to happen, it's easier for me to nut. If I experience some stress, if I experience some anxiety dealing with a woman for whatever reason, then it makes it much easier for me to come and have sex when I'm penetrating a woman. And why am I saying this? So when it came to the foot fetish thing, over time, it became a situation where uh, I was with a woman, she gained a lot of weight, when she gained a lot of weight, it was difficult for me to maintain my sexual attraction to her. Plus, through years of religious indoctrination of desexualizing my spirituality, uh, I started to desexualize her in my mind in order to spend time around her without sinning, right? Without doing what I thought was sin, which I no longer believe is sin, which is premarital sex. And because of that, I started to develop this Madonna whore complex, right? Or at least it exacerbated it. But through that foot fetish, through learning to grow and to influence my attraction towards her breasts because her breasts would get bigger when she gained weight uh tit jobs foot jobs head boom that was good right there and she wasn't trying to have vaginal intercourse at the time because of her religious indoctrination as well so it was just a situation where this was able to sustain enough sexual energy and excitement between us until she was in a place to lose that weight again but also understand that with love what love does is it can influence your perception once realized chemistry becomes greater than curiosity then a person doesn't have to look perfect right or have to look their best at all times for you to experience the same level of attraction towards them like uh sweatpants hair tied chilling with no makeup on that's when you're the prettiest i hope that you don't take it wrong right to like you know from that song by drake best i ever had and you know she ended up losing the weight then gaining it back but when she lost the weight my attraction to her was so high that I knew that she had a capacity for it. So there was a trust that she could reach a certain peak of my attractiveness or my attraction. So even when she gained weight again, I didn't lose the same level of attraction I had lost to her previously, right? Gotta understand these aspects of sex and psychology. Gotta understand these things, right? Uh, you can develop these kinks and fetishes, sexualizing non-sexual aspects of a person's body and non-sexual aspects of your interaction. Associate, you can even use porn to do it. You can use porn to do it. I need to make a separate video about that. I don't know why it's taking me so long. I just get on here and start recording sometimes. But when you mix these things together, let's say you have a woman who's getting older. Because we're all going to get older one day. If you have a woman who's good to you, don't throw her away just because she got older. But you do want to make sure that your sexual chemistry with her is on both a dom-sub dynamic on, and on an intimacy level, a safety level. 
an emotional connection level. So in these types of scenarios, uh, let's say you're dealing with a woman and you're afraid of her getting older. Watch some granny porn, right? Look at a woman who's a milf or a woman with wrinkles or a woman with no teeth, you know, that gummy gummy. You know, when you associate your your fantasies with porn, but those are traits that your partner has or are willing to role play, then what you do is you grow your attraction to that particular thing to where it's a self-preservation sexual attraction that's inherent to you. And through that, it doesn't really depend on what your partner is currently doing in order to experience that attraction. So it creates a scenario where you can transmute that sexual attraction from something on the outside to something inside of the relationship. And then it grows the baseline of sexual attraction you have towards your partner to where with the proper level of safety being present, the sexual energy can be transmuted, right? We influence more of what we're sexually attracted to than we believe we do. This is a fact of life that I really believe because I remember being younger and being a young man who was into like Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie and the Olsen twins and Hilary Duff. I still like her and certain skinny white girls and stuff like that. And then as I got older and was in more uh, urban environments or being around my people, being around black people, uh, I started growing more and more attracted to thick women, the BBWs, and started being more and more attracted to women who showed attraction to me, brown skin women. I started being more attracted to black women. I started being more attracted to Afrocentric features. As I spent time around my father, who's a militant black man, I grew more and more attracted to those natural black African features, those Afrocentric features. And that's what turns me on, that's what arouses me, and that's what I'm attracted to most of all now. Does that mean I'm not attracted to anything else? No. But understand that everything is about narrative, especially the ego is about narrative. So what you can do is you want to put your morals and principles and values and your stances and beliefs. You want those things as close to what you're sexually attracted to as possible so that you can be in a position of having an integrated mentality when it comes to sexuality. You don't want to be a person who says this is the type of girl that I would date, but this is the type of girl I'd be freaky with. I remember seeing men in the comments of a post on Facebook talk about, man, there's some freaky shit I'll do to white girls, but I couldn't do that to one of my sisters, not to one of these black women. And I'm like, yo, why, why would you think that? What if you're dealing with a black woman who wants that, but because she picks up your energy that you wouldn't be willing to do that because you would be judgmental, that she doesn't do that with you. She just comes and does that with me. And I'm not going to judge her for it. Now, of course, have your limitations about what you're not willing to do because you don't have to be open to everything. It's not like you got to let somebody peg you just so a woman feels safe. But just understand that the more freedom that you allow a woman, the more safety that you allow a woman is competency, safety, compatibility. So what are what's her animus? What are her values? What's her social program that she was grown up with and that she's grown into as she's known you? And how competent you are as far as your skill set, your knowledge, your physical characteristics, because dick size does matter. Right. It is certain ranges where it doesn't matter as much. A woman who's had a lot, a lot of experience, it matters less. Because eventually, if a woman has enough experience, she'll come across some good little dick or some good average dick. And if a woman has no experience, it don't matter because she has nothing to compare it to. But there is this little wiggle room of this in-between space where a woman has enough experience to not be opposed to casual sex, but uh, not enough experience to be able to appreciate good dick when, when it slaps her in the face. And that is... A situation where a woman's going to value curiosity over realized chemistry and that woman's going to be a liability if you ever open her up sexually right or if she you know that's that's a liability range that's the whole phase range be careful with that like unless you're ready to jump into a relationship relatively quickly and you're very secure and your vetting process is on point for that then that's shit your chest might end up hurting i done been there before right just keep it in the butt I try to be transparent and real with y'all on this channel and say what I really think. That's why oftentimes I don't sit there and uh, uh, pre-write certain things I'm going to say on these YouTube videos because I just want to keep it real and straight and raw and, and do these things. Now, I'm going to say this. Check this out. Uh, now, I'm going to say that for another time. So. You can go from these places to understanding the different parts in a woman's body. I'm going to get back on the topic, right? Uh, the different parts of a woman's body that create orgasms that's easier to get to is the easiest one is clit. That's the easiest one. From there, you got the G spot, the A spot. I mean, you got the G spot, which is going to be easier for a man who's not as well endowed to reach as far as inside of the vagina. But then you also have the A spot, which is going to be the second deepest point within the vagina to reach. 
we got the cervical, which is the the third deepest point, but it's gonna be harder to, to give than the O spot if you have the size for it, and then you have the O spot. But the, the, the cervical area is probably gonna be the most intense and spiritual, the most relinquishing most of the time. For me, when women are having cervical orgasms, they're within subspace. So understand there takes a certain level of safety and relinquishing of control and arousal for a woman to experience pleasure and orgasms in spots of her body that typically could create pain or discomfort or feeling of neutrality. So there's some women who would feel discomfort if you're stimulating their G-spot and they're not aroused enough. Most women, if they're not aroused enough and you hit their cervix, it's gonna be painful. They might throw up. They might have a stomach ache. It's gonna hurt. And they be like, they don't wanna do that shit no more. It's like, don't do that. Just talking about it can make them feel like throwing up and give them thoughts of pain. But if they get aroused enough to where pain mixes with pleasure, then that's something that can create a new experience. Uh, there's throat gasms and understand that cervical orgasms and all I said is the old spot is the deep spot, right? That's the deepest spot within the vagina. It's on the back wall of the other side of where the cervix is, right? Uh, but that's the deepest spot in the pussy. I've given some of those, right? Not as many as the other ones, but I've given some of those as well. I'm blessed, but I ain't no donkey donkey dick nigga. I'm just like I'm blessed. You feel me? And then we got uh, what else? The cervical orgasm, the cervix. And the cervical orgasm is connected to the vagus nerve in the same way that the throat is connected to the vagus nerve. So if a woman is a binge eater or she has an eating disorder and she likes to eat for self-soothing, then chances are she has an oral fixation. If a woman is an avid smoker, then chances are she has an oral fixation. If a woman loves to sing, chances are she has an oral fixation. And what this typically means is that she finds comfort and release in the stimulating of her vagus nerve. That vagus nerve goes all the way down from, I believe, like around the spinal col column where the brain stem and like where the throat is. And it goes all the way down into where like the uterus is. And it's something that's stimulated through cervical stimulation and through throat stimulation, right? So a woman who's in her masculine energy typically is not gonna be able to deep throat unless this has become a hard skill through maybe force. Like maybe somebody forced it on her or maybe she was just very open-minded in her innocence and tried it out and a guy provided her the safety to not feel embarrassed about throwing up during, during head and then it just opens it up, right? But if a woman has enough experience with giving head and then feeling herself gag and then feeling afraid of that, then it's going to be a mental block that has to be crossed, right? It's going to be crossed through, uh, I've had this be crossed before through a woman transmuting her higher level of sexual attraction to another man and then she was able to deep throw. But you have to do it enough on a consistent basis for it to become a hard skill to where the interoception sets in and then it's like a light switch. I remember every woman I've given a vaginal orgasm to, regardless of how long it took, I've dealt with one woman where it took years. It took years for her to get there. It took damn near eight years for her to get there. And after that eight years, as soon as that light switch got flipped, it never turned back off. There was one point where the safety went so low that she stopped having them for a little bit of time. And I was dealing with anxiety and stress in the relationship, so it was easier for me to come a little bit quicker. But we quickly went up from that one orgasm to two to three to four to subspace to squirting orgasms to O spot, A spot. She still didn't have the cervical ones yet, but it's just these different experiences that can occur. A woman has to feel like it's possible. So if a woman's aroused enough and giving you head and this happens on a consistent enough basis, then it's not going to be typically too long before she's able to have a throatgasm or to have an orgasm from giving head, right? So any hole can give orgasm. Same thing with a... Uh, with anal because with, with anal sex it's going to be easier to hit the O spot and then also it's a very thin lining between the ass and the pussy so she might be able to have a G spot orgasm from it but there may also just be certain nerve endings that are very sensitive within the ass where she can have an orgasm just from the ass alone especially a woman who has a very anal disposition she's very uptight she's very uptight then it's typically going to be the overcorrection of doing something that feels very primal that's going to tap her into the deeper levels and the more primal shadowy levels of her sexuality right so these are just some concepts i really want to get off to y'all just say give some sex advice some tips some understanding about certain things because i am the sex coach i'm coach brody no i'm not certified i just got experience you know people ask me for advice i gave them advice too many people were asking me for advice so i started making youtube videos and people started paying me money so i started charging for my advice instead of just giving it to people for free all the time but 
I can make these YouTube videos to help people out with a lot of this information, right? And uh, it's a lot of different things to understand, right? Sometimes you just got to paint a picture. I'm just trying to stream of consciousness this video. Uh, I remember one time, because I'll say this, one out of every third woman, uh, woman I've ever put dick in has cried during sex from the intensity of the stimulation. And typically, it would come from either the cervical orgasm or from the A spot stimulation. For me, most of my vaginal orgasm experiences that I've given to women came from A spot stimulation. And uh, that's the easiest one for me with how my dick is built. It's easier than G spot for me. People talk about G spot shit all the time. It actually took me a long time to really start giving women G spot orgasms. And it was just so easy for me to give A spot orgasms once I started because understand that with competency, the interoception is not only with the woman, the interoception is also with you. There's certain uh, micro angles, certain changes, certain slight changes in angle and pace and intensity that create the capacity to be able to know how to lock into a woman's uh, pattern, to lock into that woman's uh, rhythm of what gets her to that place of orgasm. You can give a woman great stimulation, but it's overstimulating and she's not going to be able to get to the orgasm. You can provide a woman stimulation that doesn't lock her in enough. So it feels good, but she's not getting there, right? So with your interoception, with your own mind-body connection, you learn how to tease, to edge, to create pleasure denial, delay gratification. You learn how to orbit, right? You learn how to give forced orgasms. You know how to uh, do orgasm control. You learn how to create a level of trust where a woman relinquishes a certain amount of control to where it's very, very easy for you to give and generate those types of orgasmic experiences. But part of that comes from your own level of competency, how well the connection is between your mind and your body when it comes to the experience that you're trying to give. One of the easiest way to do it, though, is just when you're having sex with a woman, tell her to get into a certain position. But then when she gets into that position, tell her to keep adjusting her body until you're hitting right on that spot if she don't know about this shit don't jump straight into saying oh this particular spot go to the a spot no just whatever spot feels really good for her just have her keep adjusting until she's right there you adjust yourself until you're in a comfortable enough position to be able to create stimulation for that consistently and persistently and then you find the pace and the rhythm that'll get her there sometimes it's going to be more aggressive sometimes it's going to be a little bit more subdued and that's just kind of how it works so this is Coach Brody. I'm out.